sanctity stuff. Um, so of course it's normal in seminars to sort of do this default, thank people for the invite, which doesn't seem to really apply for these sorts of introduce yourself talks. So instead I will thank Tim for my salary, which has made Corona times much less stressful. Uh, okay, so my plan is to sort of talk about three different topics each in a little bit of detail, uh, because I know these days I think the QM group's quite broad. So hopefully by doing this, I'll, I'll say at least one thing that, that each person in the audience will find interesting. Okay, so since it's sort of an introduce myself talk, I thought just before I talked about physics, I would, I would mention something in my life uh, outside of work. So I'm going to refer to this as testing causality and the transfer of kinetic energy to inanimate objects, sometimes combined with tests of Newtonian gravity. Okay. So these are some pictures from a training camp a few years ago. Uh, towards the right of the, 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 the photo, you can see uh, a breeze block that is a concrete breeze block that is just kind of stood there uh, somewhat unoffensively. And then this is something we call a mid-air kick. So you jump up, you rotate 180 degrees, and you take the foot that was the foot behind you to start with and introduce it assertively to the breeze block. And I can assure you all that this is lots of fun as long as you get it right. And the times you don't get it right, it is substantially less fun. Uh, but, but those are stories for another time. Anyway, I am of course only showing you these photos uh, in case any of you are thinking of asking any difficult questions later on. Okay, so that's enough about me. So let's talk about some work. So, as I say, three topics. So I'm going to sort of just say something about dark matter and about constraining the, the properties of dark matter. And then sort of a, a step change to something just to do with scan strategies for, for ground-based CMB experiments. And then, so those will be hopefully about 10 minutes each. And then I'll hopefully spend about 20 minutes on the, the topic at the end, which is about the Newtonian limit and the Newtonian approximation. Uh, and so my, my promise is I will try and make the, the middle topic not scare the theorists. And I will try and make the final topic, which is possibly a bit abstract, interesting for the observers. So those are my goals. Okay, okay. so the first topic, dark matter. So I don't know if you guys will have, have thought about it this way, but cold dark matter is really, really boring. Okay, if you think about what you can put into a universe, Obviously a cosmological constant is probably the simplest thing you can put into a universe, but then cold dark matter is the next simplest thing you can put into a universe. So if you think in, in terms of you know, what it's got, it's just got a, an energy density, okay? So it's energy momentum tensor basically just has the, the rho, the density term. And so like I say, this is the most boring thing you can do. And this is appropriate for some dark matter models, right? So WIMPs, Generally, there's a caveat that I'll mention in a minute, but generally WIMPs are very well described by this very boring object. But there are a lot of dark matter candidates that are not described by this most boring object, right? So for example, warm dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, these things require something a bit more interesting. And of course, in a standard Boltzmann code, in a standard cosmological analysis, you make this assumption of this most boring form of dark matter. And so the idea behind all of this, this, this sort of work I'm about to discuss is just to allow dark matter to be a bit more interesting and then to, uh, to throw some cosmological data at it and see if the data then tells you actually it is interesting or no, you were fine in the first place with you know, this boring cold dark matter. Thing. Okay. So the, to do this, what we do is we upgrade this energy momentum tensor. So we take this cold dark matter energy momentum tensor and we upgrade it a bit to make it a bit more interesting. So we add this pressure term and then a shear term. And don't worry too much about what these are, um, but the important thing is that the pressure contributes at both the background level and at the perturbative level. So when you're worrying about how the fluctuations in the universe behave and the shear doesn't contribute at the background, but only when you're worrying about fluctuations. And then a technical point for the theorists, of course, we need some closure equations when, when we're defining this object. And that's where all the, the kind of theoretical technicalities and the jiggery pokery happens. And I, I'm not going to go into that today. But basically, all that matters is that we end up adding three new parameters to our cosmological model. So we have an equation of state for our dark matter, which controls the background pressure. 
we add a sound speed, which controls the pressure perturbation, the pressure fluctuation, and then a viscosity, which controls the shear perturbation. And the nice thing is that cold dark matter is a limit of this model. So if we set all these, all these three parameters to zero, we recover at cold dark matter. Okay, so the reason we think this is uh, a good way of kind of generalizing dark matter uh, is that this way of doing it does capture warm dark matter, it does capture fuzzy dark matter. It also captures this funny effective field theory of large scale structure thing. So this is related to that caveat I mentioned earlier, which is that if you have even, you know, an exact cold dark matter, an exact pressureless perfect fluid, then when you start generating nonlinearities on small scales, you start having an effect back a little bit on your large scales and you generate like an effective sound speed and things like this. And this generalized dark matter model can also capture kind of these things. So that's why we think this is a good way to sort of generalize cold dark matter. Okay, so what happens if you give dark matter, cold dark matter, an equation of state? Well, of course you change the expansion history of the universe. So this means you change your, your distance to last scattering, you change your matter radiation equality. But actually kind of the, we found that the best way to think about this equation of state of the dark matter when we're looking at constraints is in terms of the, the standard A cube scaling. Okay, so we all know from, from basic cosmology that our, our energy density of our cold dark matter goes as one over A cubed. But as soon as you have an equation of state that, that varies, then actually dark matter doesn't have to have this scaling and it can deviate from this exact one over A cubed scaling. And this is really the best way to think about the constraints on the equation of state. So that's what I've got here in this plot. So uh, our x-axis here is, is time, is the scale factor, and our y-axis is essentially the, the dark matter density at that point in time, assuming a cube scaling. And then the blue and the red lines that go across this plot represent the constraints at different points in time. So a perfectly flat horizontal line here would be cold dark matter. Okay. And essentially that would be because of our constraints from Planck, that would be roughly where this yellow band across the middle of the, the plot is. And then, for example, the blue curve here shows you at different times how close you must be to that one over A cubed scaling. And so you can see around sort of recombination times, so sort of uh, 10 to the minus three or so on for the scale factor. Actually, we've got really good constraints, even allowing a time dependence uh, of the, this equation of state Actually, we know that around this point, whatever dark matter we have, it must be behaving very close to this A cube scaling. And then at different times, these constraints get worse, sort of as you see them come, come flatter, come further away either side of the, the small yellow line. But even then, you know, these things aren't changing by an order of magnitude, okay? So, you know, this is really chalking up another victory for Lambda CDM in some sense that we've actually added to make this plot eight different parameters so we've added eight parameters just to represent a possible modification of an equation of state. And our current data says, basically, no, go, go back to cold dark matter. There's nothing to see here. So not only is this sort of chalk one up for cold dark matter, but you also have to then take this into account if you're doing, you know, if you have a funky dark matter model that you're like, this is the thing that everyone should be working on. On some level, it has to satisfy this constraint. So it can't have an arbitrary scaling to be consistent with current data. Okie dokie. So what about the sound speed and the viscosity? So these only affect the perturbations. These don't affect the background. They only deal, they only deal with how your fluctuations in your universe evolve. And basically what they both do is cause your matter power spectrum, your density fluctuations to be damped. And they do that beyond this scale here that we call K decay. So it doesn't matter the exact form of this, all that matters is that it's a function of the sound speed and the viscosity. And so as you turn these parameters on, if you compare the red line here to the, the blue and the black dashed ones, you see we got this fall off compared to CDM. And that, that's caused by both of these parameters. The only difference is if you do it entirely with the CS squared, the sound speed parameter rather than the viscosity parameter, you get some little fluctuations, so you get primarily damping, but then also some little fluctuations. And if you just turn the viscosity on, then you only get the damping and you don't get the fluctuations. 
but the fluctuations are subdominant. Basically just you get less density perturbations if you turn these parameters on. Okay, so what this means is that, you know, because your matter power spectrum is something that uh, grows over time, then actually the best constraints on these parameters come from late time probes. Okay, your primary CMB is not a great probe of these parameters. It can do so good, but only so good. But then if you consider things like lensing data, CMB lensing data, large scale structure data, you can actually then start to constrain these parameters as well. Right, and so here's a really fun plot where we've ruled out lambda CDM of four sigma. Okay, so let me just take a moment to sort of explain what this plot means. So basically, this is a you know a constraint plot, a contour plot in the plane that is these two parameters. So on the y-axis we've got the viscosity, and on the x-axis we've got the sound speed. And remember that the bottom left corner of this plot, the zero, zero point is cold dark matter, okay? And then what we've got here is basically four sets of constraints. So the green contours, so here, and then the black dashed lines are for a conservative choice of matter power spectrum data, okay? And the difference between the green and the black is whether or not we did any nonlinear modeling. So the green is without the nonlinear modeling and the black is with a halo model as a form of some nonlinear modeling. But the takeaway message from the green and the black contours is that they're basically the same. Okay, so the black dashed and the green here and the black dashed and the green here are basically the same. And so these constraints, you know, this sort of conservative cut on the matter power spectrum data is quite robust and we can trust it. And we're actually putting constraints on about 10 to the minus six or so, maybe down to 10 to the minus seven. So I should actually say that the reason all of these things follow this triangular form with this diagonal kind of line is because of that degeneracy I mentioned on the previous slide. So that's because of this K decay depending on both of these parameters. And that's why you get this kind of triangular form here. Okay, so the, that was the conservative cut for the matter power spectrum data. We also did a non-conservative cut. Okay, so for the for linear only modeling with a non-conservative cut for the data, we get the blue contour. And for the non-linear modeling, we get the orange contour. So there's a couple of things to notice here. One is that the contours have got much smaller. So there is a lot of information on these extra scales if we can work out how to use it properly. The other thing is that the blue and the orange disagree. Okay, so this is worrying. This means that your choice of how you model the non-linear scales matters, which we kind of expect on these scales. And the orange contour where we use our halo model, actually, you can see is four sigma discrepant from the zero, zero point. Now, of course, we're not saying that you should go around telling everyone that lambda CDM is ruled out at four sigma. Okay, the point we make in the paper is just that, you know, look, these scales are really powerful, but you need to be really sure that you're handling the nonlinear scales properly. If you want to be able to you know, make any definitive statements from, from this data. But if we can handle the nonlinear scales really rigorously, then you know, we, we're going to get something really powerful here. Okie dokie. So I think that was everything I wanted to say about this first topic. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to the next topic? You will, of course, have time at the end as well, but it's just if there's anything that someone's really burning to ask. Very quick question. Did you use, uh, did you assume massless neutrinos or you assume massive neutrinos? Ah, this is a great question. We have an entire section on this paper where we add in a neutrino mass and allow that to vary as well and how that affects the constraints. Because of course that is, you know, as I presume is why you're asking, that is of course degenerate with your choice of dark matter. So it, it's not in this plot, but we have got some stuff in the in that paper where we worry about how how varying your your neutrino mass, you know, introduces an extra degeneracy and therefore degrades your constraints on your dark matter properties. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so now for something completely different. So this is a, a picture from WMAP of the, the polarization that the WMAP satellite measured. So for anyone that, that hasn't looked at CMB polarization, you don't need to know a lot about it for this, for this bit, I'm going to say. All you basically need to know is that it's another source of information about the universe and we want to measure it. And we typically express it in terms of these E and B mode patterns where the B mode is, is much smaller than the E mode. 
and has information that's not in the emote. And so it's the target for the next generation of surveys is to try and measure this really small BMO signal. And basically the question to have in mind over the next couple of slides is, why does measuring polarization depend strongly on how my telescope scans the sky? Okay, and that's sort of the, the background question to what I'm gonna say over the next couple of slides. Okay, so the reason of course is that polarization has an orientation. If we're just trying to measure the, the temperature of the CMB, then you know, our detectors don't have an orientation. We don't need to worry about you know, what angle they're scanning the sky at. But for polarization, we know this isn't true. Polarization is a, is a spin to field or a headless vector, which are both fancy ways of saying that if you rotate you know, a polarization signal by 180 degrees, you get back to where you started. But of course, for the temperature, it doesn't matter. And so what this means is you need to worry about the orientation of the sensitivity of your detectors. Okay, so you can see why on this slide, you can see why I'm a scientist and not an artist. This is my attempt to give you a picture of what's going on here. So our blue circle here represents a focal plane in our telescope. And then these black lines represent different detectors. And you can see they each have an orientation. And then as our focal plane wanders across the sky, picking up all the information that we want to have, then the orientation of these detectors changes as we go across different pixels. And so that means that kind of the, the polarization signal we, we pick up will change because of this change in orientation. And so what we want to do is, so we scan the sky once and our focal plane goes across the sky. For that scan, we have crossed each pixel at a particular angle, a particular orientation. So now what we want to do is go back and scan the sky again, such that we cross each pixel at a different angle this time. And if we cross each pixel at enough different angles, this is how we then disentangle our T signal and our polarization signal. And if we don't have enough of these angles, we can't do that and we get in a mess. Okay, so this is not the end of the story though, because we have systematics. And because of how different systematics work, some systematics also have a spin, so they have an orientation that matters, and some of them couple to the scan strategy. So we need some kind of formalism for worrying about what our scan strategy looks like in terms of these different spins and how it's going to couple to different systematics. And so we define these H numbers. Don't worry too much about the maths. They're just some combination of cos and sine of you know, the different crossing angles you had in each pixel. The important thing is that if your H numbers are zero, then your scan is perfect. You cannot do any better than this. If your H values are one, then you've done really badly and you couldn't possibly have done any worse. And of course, every realistic survey is somewhere in between and the game is to make these numbers as small as possible. And so just to give you an idea of, of how these might look in practice, these are the H1 maps for two satellites, so WMAP and Planck. And you can see that the W map one is, is very close to zero. If you look at the color bar, this blue is all close to zero. So basically the W map H1 scan was pretty good. And in fact, generally this is what you find, right? You have so much more freedom with a satellite experiment that you can make these maps really good and make them very close to zero for a satellite. Planck had a funny thing in its scan strategy where something varied very slowly in its scan strategy. And that's what caused these problems at the poles where this H1 map wasn't very optimal. And this H1 I'm talking about would couple to, for example, a pointing error. So what this means is, you know, you think you know where your satellite is looking or your telescope on the earth is looking, but actually it's not looking exactly where you think it is. Or you have two detectors next to each other in the focal plane that you think you've glued them in so that they're looking at the same direction in the sky, but actually you haven't. And so if you have these sorts of instrumental problems, then this H1 map will, will be kind of be what those systematics couple to and how they appear in your contaminating maps in your survey. OK. So, of course, this is all very nasty and horrible. We don't want systematics coupling to our scan strategy, but we can flip all of this around. And we can turn this into an opportunity so we can say, OK, well, if I know that I have certain systematics that will couple to my scan strategy in certain ways, what can I do to mitigate that? Can I do clever things with my scan strategy that allows me to solve these systematic problems? 
And the answer is you can. And so this top right plot here is an example of a trick you can do. So the, the Simons Observatory, which is being built in the, the Atacama Desert and is sort of a, a precursor and building towards these you know, fancy stage four CMB surveys, uh, it has a large aperture telescope. And this large aperture telescope has this fancy thing it can do and that it can flip over. So what this means is, imagine you've pointed your telescope west, you turn your telescope, you scan around until it's pointing east, and you can then flip the telescope over the top so it's back pointing west again. The advantage of being able to do this is you've now flipped your focal plane, or more accurately, you've rotated your focal plane 180 degrees with respect to where it originally was when it was pointing at the sky. Now this 180 degrees is special because it relates to the spin properties of these different systematics and, and polarization signals. So in particular, if you scan the sky in a particular way and you then do this flip of your telescope, so you've rotated your focal plane by 180 degrees and then do the exact same scan of the sky again, this H1 signal that I showed you here will be automatically zeroed. Okay, at least for the detector at the center of the focal plane, you will have completely zeroed this H1 quantity. So any systematics that couple to this H1 quantity, you've got rid of without throwing any data away, just through a clever choice of your scan strategy. And so that's what this plot is. So the orange points, which are what are being traced by the black dashed line, that is the systematic contaminant to your B mode signal before you do anything clever with your scan. And then the blue dots here, which are about three orders of magnitude lower, represent the clever version of the scan strategy. So when you flip the telescope and you can see that it's three orders of magnitude lower. So this original systematic signal is about the same order of magnitude as the lensing B mode that you were looking for. And just by scanning the sky in a particular way and then flipping the telescope and doing the same thing again, we've reduced this systematic by more than three orders of magnitude. Okie dokie. So just one last thing then on this sort of scanning the sky topic. So if you look at these two plots down at the bottom here, this is a game of spot the difference. Okay, if you can spot the difference, I take my hat off to you because I have no idea. So what this was, was in the process of making this formalism to describe the different systematics and explain how they couple to the survey, we realized that we'd come up with a way to um, without simulating the full scan and the full experiment, we were able to make maps of how certain systematics will contaminate the survey. And we were doing this for systematics that people hadn't got these shortcut simulations for before. And it basically it all comes out of, you know, this stuff about the H1 maps and so on that, I, that I've just explained. But basically what you can do is you can save some information about your survey. And from there, you can directly make maps of how different systematics would contaminate your experiment without going through the laborious process of asking minute by minute for the course of a year what your survey's doing and where your telescope's pointing and everything that's going on. Okie dokie, so that was all I sort of wanted to say about this sort of scanning the sky stuff. Are there any burning questions? I see there's something in the chat. Uh, what's this about? Recognizing polarizations. Yeah, so I'll, I'll mention that in a bit more detail then in the student chat, if, if that's okay. That seems to be that. Um, are there any other burning questions before I move on? So all the theorists can wake up now. They can, they've avoided the, the scary bit and they can wake up and we'll talk about something that'll be hopefully a bit more pleasing for the theorists. There we go. Okay. So something about gravity and the Newtonian limit. So the Newtonian limit or the Newtonian approximation. And in fact, really, this is, this is a tale of two limits that I'm about to tell. So this is the bit where I need to try and get a zoom to do what I want. So let's ask the question, how do, we, how do cosmologists understand gravity? And how do cosmologists do gravitational equations? And the answer to that is in this picture here. So you can see across the large scope of our universe, across the largest scales, we use Einstein gravity and we understand the universe you know, through Einstein's lens, so to speak. 
Now, if I can make Zoom work. No, I can't make Zoom work. There we go. Ah, there we go. So now if we zoom in on our picture of the universe, this is what happens. It'll take a sec to load because it's a massive file. But as we zoom into small scales on the universe, we find Isaac Newton. Okay. Of course, because we use embodied simulations. Okay, so we're using essentially Newtonian equations on small scales in the universe. So now I need to work out how to zoom back out without breaking the computer. So this is, this is how cosmologists think about gravity and how cosmologists understand gravity. So let's think about this in a bit more detail. So on the largest scales in cosmology, we use perturbation theory. So what we say is all our fluctuations in our universe are small, and this allows us to simplify our general relativistic equations, because if we couldn't simplify them, we'd be done. We wouldn't be able to solve anything. But we can do this. These fluctuations are small, and that's how we do all our calculations on our largest scales. So on the smaller scales, then, what do we do? Well, really, we're dealing with the Newtonian limit of general relativity. So rather than assuming that our fluctuations are small, we assume that we're well below the horizon and we neglect time derivatives. It's a bit more technical than that, but it's basically that. OK, so something that's not really talked about or not explicitly talked about is, well, what if there's a regime in the middle? Maybe there's a range of scales in the universe where neither the approximations that apply on our large scales or the approximations that apply on our small scales actually apply. Okay. And ideally what we want in order to study gravity and cosmology is we want a single framework that applies on all of these scales, right? We want a single set of gravitational equations that does the small scales, that does the large scales, and in case it exists, does this intermediate regime in the middle. Okay, so a quick technical point, because I know there are you know, plenty of people at QM who worry about relativistic effects and stuff like this. So a quick technical point for them. When I talk about Newtonian stuff here, I don't mean a Newtonian universe. What I mean is taking the Newtonian limit of the Einstein equations. So this is still being done in a fully relativistic framework. You know, so volume effects and, and you know, observers and things like this are accounted for properly. But I just mean that you know, instead of using perturbation theory to simplify the Einstein equations, I'm using a sort of one over C, low velocity, et cetera, et cetera, expansion of the Einstein equations. Okay, so it happens that, that Marco Bruni at Portsmouth with a, a student came up with a formalism that can be used to describe gravity on all of these scales. Okay, these equations are terrifying. Don't look at them, don't worry. Um, they're only there in order to scare you. You don't need to understand them. So what this sort of formalism is, is it's a, a cosmological type of post-Newtonian expansion. So it's one of these one over C expansions where we're assuming that essentially time derivatives are higher order. Um, we're well below the horizon, although actually Marco's approach removes that, which is one of the important things. And that we're dealing with matter that isn't moving fast. Crucially, it doesn't require that the density fluctuation is small. Okay. And basically, by expanding this uh, process up to a sufficiently high order, you can get sets of equations that describe the large scales. They describe the linear perturbations on large scales, but that which also can work on small scales where the density contrast is large. OK. And in fact, they would also describe this intermediate regime as well. But as I'm sure you can all see, these equations are awful. You never actually want to try and solve these equations. You never want to work with these equations. In some sense, they're no use to us. They're too complicated. So the question is, can we simplify them? And the answer is yes. So this is, again, a slightly technical point. Um, I'll hopefully make it less technical in a second. So bear with me for a moment. But basically, what you can do is you can organize a lot of the terms that are making these equations complicated and sort of group them into this schematic term here that I've called the nonlinear terms or the intermediate regime terms. OK, so if you have terms that uh, neither the small scale uh, approximations apply to and the large scale approximations don't apply to, these are the terms that are going to matter in that possible intermediate regime. And so what we're doing is we're just schematically bundling together into this bit here all of those terms that don't exist in either limit. 
And what we can see is if we do that, actually we're left with a relatively simple equation, okay? And in fact, the equation we're left with other than this schematic term here is basically just a relativistic Poisson equation. But it's a relativistic Poisson equation that doesn't assume that your matter fluctuations are small, doesn't assume that you're well below the horizon or any of these other things that we normally worry about. Okay, so in, in principle, we haven't actually achieved anything yet, of course. All I've done is I've told you, well, there's a whole bunch of terms and I'm gonna call them this intermediate regime thing, but I haven't actually simplified the equation yet. I haven't done anything to make your life easier. So let's just go back to thinking about this intermediate regime for a second. Can I ask a question about that formalism? Yep. Uh, would you mind going back to the previous slide? So um, this is this is something I haven't understood about this before. So so now you're talking about it. Perhaps I can I can I can ask. So um, when when you are doing these expansions, so you, you, as you say, you're effectively doing a post Newtonian expansion here. Um, so so you're expanding in in um, orders of v over c essentially. So that, that means that you're, you're restricted to relatively small spatial scales in cosmology. So, so in particular, you're limited to scales where the speed of light isn't going over, the speed of the, the Hubble velocity isn't going over about 1% of the speed of light. So otherwise the expansion breaks down, right? Uh, so I think not, I certainly hope not, otherwise everything I'm about to say goes out the window. Um, so something I'm about to cover is you can't do this for a universe with arbitrary contents. But cold dark matter, you know, a cold dark matter or a lambda and cold dark matter dominated universe, actually you can do this expansion in such a way that you recover perturbation theory on large scales. Yeah, well, it's that I was getting to really. So, so the expansion itself, a post-Newtonian expansion, is valid up to a certain spatial scale in the universe. So, so when, when um, you know, Marco and his collaborators were developing this, that, that's the expansion they were using, which is fine. But at some point they, they, they said they included large scale fluctuations by getting rid of anything that was nonlinear after they'd already used the post-Newtonian expansion. So it seems a bit confusing to me. You'd use an expansion that's valid on uh, right. spatial scales okay. and then try and say that some parts are valid on large scales. Right, okay. So I think this is essentially where the, what he calls the resumed potentials come from, okay? Um, yes, yeah, so basically, yeah, what you do is you is you don't solve order by order. You go, you expand up to the order you need to have to have all the effects you want. And then you basically do uh, these resumed potentials where you, you sum the perturbations that occur in the metric at different orders into a single variable. And that single variable will behave the way your linear perturbation variables behave on large scales but it's derived within an expansion that isn't valid on large scales. Uh, is it derived within an expansion that isn't valid on large scales? I think that's probably too much of a rabbit hole to get into now. Um, my understanding is that the resumming, if that is a problem, the resumming solves it. But I suspect this is probably a very technical discussion. Okay, well, let's save that for another time then. So yeah, it, yeah, it's definitely something we should talk about, but yeah. I think the resumed potential solve the problem you're worried about, but that's not a very technical answer. Um, okay. So anyway, sorry. So where was I? Um, so the interesting thing is, and this is implicitly in the literature, but no one really ever talks about it. Um, in a matter, you know, in a late time GR lambda CDM universe, so this means a lambda dominated or a matter dominated universe, this intermediate regime I've talked about, this possible intermediate regime doesn't exist. And actually the, the regime of validity of these two limits overlaps. And there is a regime in the middle where you can actually do your gravitational calculations using the equations from either limit. Um, so this is not true in every universe, but it is true in a, in a late time GR lambda CM universe where late time I basically mean since the CMB. Um, so why does this matter? So it matters because I just told you that we can rearrange this equation into a simple thing plus a whole bunch of complicated terms that only matter in the intermediate regime. And now I've told you that there is no intermediate regime in certain cosmologies. So what that means is I can drop all these terms, okay? And what I'm left with is a single Poisson equation that is valid on all scales. It contains the linear limit, it contains the small scale limit, 
It doesn't require that I'm well within the, the horizon. It doesn't require that my density perturbations are small. So I have a single equation sort of describing how my gravity works that I can apply on all scales. OK, and that's essentially just what I'm saying again on this slide. So there are, there are some caveats that there needs to be no intermediate regime and your Newtonian limit needs to be well defined. Um, but as long as these things are true, then uh, gravity is described on all scales by this equation. Ah, the question about gauges. It's in Poisson gauge. So yeah, conformal Newtonian with a particular choice of, of the vector perturbation. Um, so I should add an extra kind of uh, comment here for sort of people who, who are used to dealing with gravity that of course one equation is not enough. We need a second equation because in you know, GR and sort of generally in relativistic theories, we have two gravitational potentials rather than the one we have in Newtonian theory. So of course I need to supplement this equation with a second equation. And that second equation basically is just the two potentials are equal. And so combining that and this Poisson equation, I can basically do my gravitational dynamics on all scales with a single set of equations. So now what you're wondering is great, but why should I care about this, right? This seems like a curiosity, right? You know, this is no, we're not gonna be able to do anything new in a GR lambda CDM point of view from anything I've just said, because we've kind of used it all implicitly with how cosmologists do their calculations on different scales and how they combine them. But by articulating all of this explicitly, it gives us a way forward for something that should be useful for modified gravity. So I will tell you what that is in a few minutes, but first I will just quickly motivate uh, modified gravity and why we should care about modified gravity. And in particular, why we should worry about what I call model independent modified gravity. Okay, so the idea here is that in the Y modified gravity section, I'm hopefully gonna wind up the observers. And then in the Y model independent section, I'm hopefully gonna wind up the theorists. So we'll see how well that goes. So why modified gravity? Well, simply put, it's not ruled out, okay? It, it could be there and we should keep testing it. I mean, you can worry about motivations like for example, the dark sector for which we only have gravitational evidence. We still haven't found WIMPs despite decades of searches. We have cosmological tensions emerging. So I think all of these can give you motivations to worry about modified gravity. Do you need to you know, change these things, these assumptions in our model? But for me, actually, it's just that I think we should test gravity. You know, if you think about what we do in cosmology, we regularly extrapolate by orders of magnitude you know, to regimes where you know, we are doing the first observations and the first tests. And if we're doing that, we should keep testing gravity, okay? Okay, so hopefully that, that convinces you that it's worth thinking about modified gravity and not just assuming that, that GR is the be all and end all of everything. But what about model independent modified gravity? So by this, I just sort of mean not specifying a particular model and just trying to ask in general, how could gravity be different from GR? And for me, the main reason for doing this is that I don't think any of the models we really play with in cosmology are very well motivated. They're sort of toy models that, you know, we use them because we know how to do the calculations in them. You know, most of them don't really solve any conceptual problems or anything like this. Okay, so something else I should say is that, um, you know, people talk about Horndesky gravity. Uh, so Horndesky is general, but it's not that general. We know lots of theories of gravity that are not in the Horndesky framework. But again, for me, the, the main reason for looking at, at model independent modified gravity is almost a philosophical thing, okay? You know, what it does is it gives us very powerful null tests of our standard cosmology. And it means we don't assume that we already know the right answer when we look at the data. So just a, a quick aside here for anyone that doesn't, doesn't know this story. Um, there was a French astronomer, uh, Urbain Le Verrier uh, in the 19th century, and he, uh, there's a story that involves him and the planet Neptune and the planet Vulcan. And anyone that doesn't know this parable, I advise you to go and read about it or ask someone because it's really fascinating. But basically the, the bottom line, the spoiler is that in this story, Neptune was dark matter and general relativity was modified gravity in the story. And in fact, it was the modified gravity that meant that the, the dark matter that, that was the planet Vulcan wasn't needed in our model of the world. Okay. Right, so hopefully I've, I've convinced you that you should care about model independent modified gravity. So what's the state of play? 
So the state of play is that people have spent a decade doing some really clever and in-depth and, and really cool work uh, using GR perturbative frameworks, okay? So things that apply on these large scales uh, are now understood pretty well. And I should say at this point, of course, of, you know, Tessa is, is you know, one of the leading people absolutely in the world on this stuff. So you should, you should ask her if, if you're interested in this stuff. But basically the, the bottom line is that, you know, you have these two, in this context, linear perturbative equations. So they're assuming your density contrast is small. You have one that's like a Poisson equation and one that describes how your two potentials relate to each other. And you can add these sort of parameters or functions into these equations and they allow you to describe the effects of modified gravity in a pretty generic way. But because all of this is built on these sort of perturbative frameworks and assuming that the, the density fluctuation is small, these things don't apply on small scales. And in fact, there isn't, there isn't really a, a, a single proper formulation of, of model independence for modified gravity on these small scales. Although, again, I should, I should mention you know, some work here. So, so Tim's done some work and also uh, Lucas Lombreiser at Geneva uh, has done some work. Uh, and both of these sort of bear on how certain aspects of theory space should look on these small scales in the universe. So what people have done on the small scales is run modified embodied codes. So they picked a very specific modified gravity model and they've you know, modified an embodied code and simulated the universe. So why am I going on about this so much about these small scales and wanting to use all scales? So future surveys, Euclid, LSST, SKA, you know, insert your favorite upcoming cosmological survey here. These are gonna have a lot of data on nonlinear scales. So if we want to constrain modified gravity in a model independent way, using these surveys, we're gonna to have to throw most of the data away. And is this a problem? Well, I have a somewhat strong opinion on this in that I, don't, I think this is not just an elephant in the room. I think this is a whole safari, right? You know, these are wonderful, wonderful surveys that the community are putting an incredible amount of time and effort and expertise into. Okay, so these are really powerful things. But from, for investigating modified gravity in a model independent way, most of that is going to be wasted. It's going to be thrown away. And I, I just think this is a real shame, right? These are really powerful surveys and we want to use all of that. And I'm sure at this point, you've all put two and two together and seen where this is going. I spent 10 minutes telling you, here's an equation that describes gravity on all scales. And now I've told you I want to test modified gravity on all scales. And so of course, the thing to do is use those equations that I put together in GR that I said aren't useful to us in GR but what they can be used for is to sort of explain how deviations from gravity might work on all scales in the universe, okay? And so we have, again, what's essentially a Poisson equation that be, applies on all scales and has a parameter or a function that represents the effect of modified gravity. And then again, an equation relating the two potentials with, you know, a parameter or function that represents modified gravity. Okay, and this can be used to analyze all the data from all surveys on all scales. Now, of course, this all sounds very grand, so I should instantly start telling you some caveats, one of which is that the, these mu and eta functions will be substantially more complicated on nonlinear scales than they are on linear scales. So by writing the equations like this, I am sweeping a lot of things under the carpet, and you should be aware that I'm sweeping a lot of things under the carpet. It's a solvable problem, and we know what these things look like already on nonlinear scales in some theories, but just be aware that these things will be complicated. The other caveat is that, of course, in deriving this equation, my chain of logic that got me here was to have a cosmology where I didn't have this problematic intermediate regime. So modified gravity theories, in order to be described by these two equations, they need to not have one of these intermediate regimes that cause problems. Okay. Uh, so, so sorry, we can... Hello? Can, can, I, can I barge in quickly? Sorry. Yeah. So on, on, the, on the previous slide, uh, so the, the, the right-hand side, is, isn't that just the, the equation that um, David Wands and Anse wrote down some, some time, long time ago? So the, the, the density contrast is in co-moving gauge and the left-hand side is in uh, Poisson gauge. And then you also add some perturbation 
to this as well. I yeah, so it's essentially the same equation arrived at with different logic. But yeah, it's essentially the same. Okay. Okay. Although I think their equation assumes linear perturbations, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so to get to this equation, I haven't assumed a small density fluctuation. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. But yes, it, it's essentially the same equation and it's essentially, it's kind of parallel logic that, that it gets there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm not gonna go through the, the details of what this algorithm is. There's just some you know, gory details on the slide for those that care. But basically this is a set of tests that we can apply to any particular modified gravity theory that will tell us whether it has one of these intermediate regimes and therefore whether or not it will be covered by these equations that I've just written down. Okay, and like I say, the, the gory details don't matter. The important things are one, we know what these tests are. Two, we know how to do them. And three, we've actually already applied them to some modified gravity theory. So F of R, for example, works within this framework. F of R gravity, or at least Kusevitsky F of R gravity, doesn't have one of these intermediate regimes, which means that it can be described on all scales by a set of parameterized equations like this. Okay, okay. Right. So the only other thing I sort of wanted to say, which is kind of relates to this um, intermediate regime issue, uh, is, a, is a hunch I want to share with you. I can't prove this at the moment, it's just a guess. But basically, in our universe, from the observations we've made, the Newtonian approximation seems to work astonishingly well, probably better really than we should expect it to. And so what this means is that any modified gravity theory that, that has one of these problematic intermediate regimes, it's gonna have a range of scales where it's gonna give very different uh, predictions to a Lambda CDM universe. And so my, my guess, my hunch is that any theory that doesn't satisfy this restriction. So any theory that fails this algorithm, that fails these tests, any theory that has one of these problematic intermediate regimes probably is already ruled out if you work out all the consequences of it, because it won't be able to deliver a sufficiently Lambda CDM like universe. But that's entirely a guess at this point, I can't prove it. Okay, so just some sort of closing remarks on this, on this gravity stuff. So we have a, a Poisson equation and a slip equation that allow us to describe gravity on all scales, uh, and in particular, even if the density contrast is large. And the advantage of having this is that we can use it to analyze and combine data from any surveys that you know, integrate over any combination of scales. But there's a lot more development required before we're at the point where we can really start you know, applying it to data. So one of the things is that these mu and eta functions that I mentioned, they sweep a lot of these things under the carpet and there's many possible functional forms you could consider for these parameters, okay? And I sort of mentioned before that, that Lucas's work at, at Geneva, essentially you can reinterpret his work in terms of the framework I've, I've presented here. And that tells you what these mu and eta functions look like on nonlinear scales for F of R gravity. And I think some, some DGP gravity and a few other things as well. So my preferred approach is, is a slightly, again, sort of a slightly philosophical point of view, which is I, I think it's good to do something kind of maximally empirical. So what I mean by this is that we don't assume any time or space dependence of these two functions. Instead, what we do is we sort of just divide them into time and space intervals. And we choose a number of intervals that is appropriate for the constraining power of the survey we're interested in. And then we throw the data at it. And we say, is there any evidence in this survey for a deviation from Lambda CDM? And I'm actually co-supervising a, a student at Manchester at the moment who started doing some simulation work along these lines. So again, I won't go into too much detail about, about the plot, but basically each color is a different simulation. And these simulations have a time dependent um, strength of gravity in that applies on all scales in a consistent manner. And essentially what, what I'm showing you here is that if you turn gravity on at different times in the universe, you maintain a memory in your cosmological observations of at what time in the universe your modified gravity was turned on. Okay, so these are matter power spectra. And basically what I've done is I've constructed them such that at redshift zero, so if we ask what the matter power spectrum is today, they have the same linear matter power spectrum. So if you look to the left of the plot, 
basically these curves are on top of each other. And this is a known thing that, you know, because the, the growth rate is, is uh, scale independent on these scales, then you can construct these things such that they all agree on linear scales. Okay. But if you look on the nonlinear scales, you get a difference. Okay, so the difference between these simulations, they all have the same linear matter power spectrum, but they have a different nonlinear matter power spectrum, a redshift zero. And so you can, you can see that you can get a scale dependent effect out of your simulations by only putting a time, only putting a time dependent, not a scale dependent strength of gravity into the simulation. And in particular, we, we think you can do something quite weird with this in the, for, for those that know about screening mechanisms, um, if you choose your parameters carefully, what you can do is you can have a modified gravity model where your nonlinear matter power spectrum on small scales returns to being equal to your lambda CDM value. And it does that without having a screening mechanism in it, which is a, a fun thing we're sort of exploring at the moment. But hopefully there'll be a, a paper out on the simulation stuff before the end of the year. Okay, so that's sort of all I wanted to say about uh, work stuff. I did have one final remark I wanted to make, which is that you know, we're living through these crazy corona times at the moment. And one of the things about a, you know, a nice department like Queen Mary's is that you, know, you can go and knock on people's office doors and chat to people in corridors. And of course, none of us can do that at the moment uh, with the result that I'm kind of just spending far too much time in my house. So if anyone is bored at any point and wants to just have a random cosmology chat as they would by knocking on someone's door, then feel free to get in touch. Okay, so that's everything.